Um, last week we finished the chapter on uh, the, our second chapter on function approximation and I think there is not much to repeat because actually last, the last lecture was kind of a repetition and summary of the whole thing. Um, so I would say you now should have um, serious basics on function approximation. This is not just the very basic introduction because you now know even up to SVD how to do linear regression. And maybe I should say a few words about linear regression again. I hope that uh, for all you it is clear now that linear regression does not mean to fit a linear function to our data points. Huh? It only means that what is the meaning of linear regression? The coefficients appear linear. Regression. Yes. And what about the, the functions? Yeah. So the point is that we work with a set of basis functions. Uh, we work with a set of basis functions and if we have 10 basis functions then we do, we approximate in this 10 dimensional uh, space parameters. So we are now in this 10 dimensional parameter space and we are looking for a set of such parameters. Uh, um, so yeah, this only works if the, the parameters appear linearly. And I, t I showed you last time examples where this is no longer possible. Uh, then you have to use methods for nonlinear function approximation and we, we don't have a closed form solution anymore like it was possible with the pseudo inverse or with SVD. Then uh, we have to use uh, iterative, um, iterative methods to determine the set of parameters. But here we really get into the uh, <coughs> mathematical off-road terrain where it's really getting rough. Okay, so we finished at this point and many problems can be solved with uh, linear regression. Um, now we go to a different team which is numerical integration. And you see in this new chapter we talk about integration, differentiation and differential equations. I mean this is really a core part of analysis. Um, and let's start with the numerical integration. Okay, we start with uh, the very basics which is the trapezoidal rule. Oh, Zeigestock. Mm -hmm. Ich zog den Zeigestock. Ah, da liegt er jetzt. Okay, and uh, I mean we don't talk about the symbolic uh, methods for uh, determining integrals. I mean that's what I expect you all know how it works. Huh? So uh, I, uh, I guess that many of you already have seen the trapezoidal rule for numerical integration but what I really expect as the basics here is you should know about symbolic integration. You should know what an integral is and you should know a couple of techniques um, for solving integrals like uh, substitution or integration by parts. Actually the first of the exercises here is an exercise where we need uh, substitution in an integral and I let you prove this small part. Huh? Um, so who has already seen uh, the trapezoidal rule? Okay, one, two, 
Okay. Um, and actually, I mean, if I would have to teach mat uh, undergraduate mathematics in the bachelor's, I would start with the chapter on integra in the chapter of, uh, about integration with this. I would not start with the classical um, uh, infinitesimal de definition of the integral. I would start with this because this is much more visual than the abstract symbolic stuff. Huh? I mean, this is really basics. This is something for kids. You could do it in school in, in fourth grade. Huh? Because what is the task here? The task is to estimate the area under a curve. So we do have a curve here, a function. And now we want to know how much area is there all together below this curve. And you could really do it with the little kids. Look here. Can you see this grid here on the blackboard? These points here, grid points? Yes? Okay. So let's play with these uh, uh, points on the grid. Suppose this is our function. And now I want to know the area below this curve. Then what I do is, I just count the number of grid cells. And it's easy to know the area of one grid cell. So if we count the number of cells below the curve, this is a lower bound for the integral. It's a lower bound for the area. And then what we could do is, we take, so this would be, a lower bound would be like this. And then we take this, this. That would be a lower bound. And then we could, of course, also get an upper bound from, let's take a different color. We do it like that. And this would be an upper bound, and it would be very easy to calculate the area. You just count the number of squares and multiply it by their elementary uh, area. Okay, so now we have a lower bound and an upper bound, and how to get an estimate for the, for the area, an even better estimate than the lower and the upper bound. What would you do? Yeah, take the mean of the lower and the upper bound. Because the real area is somewhere in between. And, and definitely, we could do this with kids in fourth grade. Huh? And what we do today is fourth grade mathematics. Huh? I mean, let's say it's fifth grade. Huh? Um, because what we do is a little bit smarter. What we do is, we take these points like this and this and then put a straight line between these. That's a little bit smarter. Because now you have to calculate the area of such trapezoids. Huh? And that's why it's called the trapezoidal rule. Look. We put an equidistant grid on our x-axis. Huh? An equidistant grid with a, a width of h of the grids. Oh, let me see. So there, is there a problem with the colors on the... Yeah, there is no red. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay. Now we have red. Um, so the width of, the, uh, of these cells in the grid is h. And now we take the function values at each one of the grid points. 
um, and we get these trapezoids. Yeah. And the era, area of one such trapezoid is quite easy. It is H, which is the width, or it, this is actually the height of the trapezoid. You should turn it around. And we multiply the height by the mean of this width and with this width. And the mean is f of xi minus 1 plus f of xi divided by 2 times h. This is the exact area of one such trapezoid. Huh? So the area of the ith of trapezoid number i is exactly this. That's really easy. Okay. Yeah, and this step size h is b minus a divided by n. So we are on the interval between a and b. b minus a divided by n is our step size h. Okay, so now we can give the formula for estimating the full integral. So we are now talking about the integral from a to b over f of x dx, a one-dimensional integral. And this one-dimensional integral, maybe we should go back here. is equal to the sum over i equal 1 to n. And now we just take this formula. h times f of xi minus 1 plus f of xi divided by 2. Okay? Um, and now we can continue. We can take the h out of the integral. And the, no, we, we keep the, 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 the one half in the integral. Um, yes. And if we take the h, yeah, h is just constant. Now let me peek here. Yes, we, take just, we just take the h out of the sum and now times. And now let's write it explicitly without the summation symbol. So this starts with f of x0 plus f of x1 divided by 2 plus f of x1 plus f of x2 divided by 2 plus and so on plus um, f of xn minus 1 plus f of xn divided by 2. Now if you look at this, then you see it starts with f of x0 divided by 2 plus f of x1 divided by 2 plus f of x1 divided by 2. So these two guys occur twice. And this is with all of them up to the last one. I mean this one is only once. And this one also is only once. All the others occur twice. And that's why here we have this formula. We have h times this first term with the one half. But all the others occur twice, so we just can cancel the one half. Huh? And the last occurs with the, with the half in the denominator. Yeah. Oh, and of course, there is a severe error here on the blackboard. Oh, this is really bad. Of course, 
I mean, if this function is not linear, then typically we don't have an equal sign here because this only is a rough approximation for that. Huh? But over here in the theorem we do have the equal sign because back here we add an error term. Huh? Okay, and, and this first part here that's what we call T of H, the trapezoidal rule, minus this error term delta T of H. So this is the error the uh, trapezoidal rule makes. Yeah. And our delta T of H, now here, look, that's why this is a theorem. I mean, up to here, there is not much to say. Because up to here, there is, there is no proposition about this error. This error may be very large. But now, this is the theorem. The theorem tells us that we do have an upper bound on the error, and that's good. I mean, whenever we talk about an error, we want to have an upper bound, not a lower bound. Huh? And this is an upper bound, so the, the absolute value of this error term is less than or equal to b minus a divided by 12 times h squared times, and now this is uh, very interesting, the, the maximum over the whole interval of the absolute value of the second derivative of f. <coughs> and this is very intuitive. I mean, why does it make sense to have the second derivative of x here? The second derivative of our function determines the upper bound of the error. Look, this is the only part that depends on our function. I mean, this is kind of a trivial part, it's a constant factor. It does not depend at all on the function. So it's only the second derivative of our function that determines the error. And why is it the second derivative? Why is it not the first or the third or something else? And I'm not asking you for a proof. I'm asking you for intuition. Look at such a picture. What is the intuition of the second derivative? Because we can determine if it's a maximum or a minimum. We can determine a maximum? Yes, but we can determine a maximum of, this, of the zeroth or the first or the third. We can determine a maximum of every derivative. What is the intuition of the second derivative? We talked about this already. Whether the function, whether the curve is continuous or not. Oh no! Oh. Please don't, don't say this. I mean, whether the function is continuous or not, it doesn't have uh, very much to do with the second derivative. Huh? With the second derivative, we know how does this function Okay, so what you, what you say is, it tells us how strongly the function changes. Actually, no. Look. This is a strongly changing function where the second derivative is zero. Why is the second derivative zero? Because it is a straight line, but uh, because the slope is very large, we have a dramatic change of the function. But let's talk about the trapezoidal rule for such a function. Suppose this is our function 
And this is our interval AB. Yeah. What about the error of the trapezoidal rule for this function which uh, has a large change in this area? What about the error of the trapezoidal rule? It's zero. It's zero. The trapezoidal rule is exact here because it is a trapezoid. So now we know why the first derivative does not appear here. Now why is it the second derivative? What's the intuition of the second derivative? I mean actually what you said is the intuition about the first derivative. The first derivative tells us how fast is the change of the function locally. Yeah, and the second derivative is nothing but the first derivative of the first derivative. So the second derivative tells us how fast does the first derivative change. So if the second derivative is non-zero, we no longer have a straight line. And then we get an error with the trapezoidal rule. Because the trapezoidal rule is only exact, oh no, for, uh, that's not true. It's not true that the trapezoidal rule is only exact if the function is a straight line. Yeah, look at this example we had on the slide here. If we take the integral between this point and this point, it may happen that these two errors cancel each other out. So the trapezoidal rule may, but only by chance, be exact even if the function is not linear. But this would only be by chance. Okay, so the second derivative tells us how fast the first derivative changes. Huh? And as soon as the second derivative is non-zero, then we get an error. And now let us understand why does the error kind of linearly increase with the second derivative. Yeah, because the second derivative, it tells us how fast the first derivative changes and this is very closely related to the radius of the curvature of our function. And now look at, at such two points. Now if this radius is infinity, then we have a, a straight line and trapezoidal rule is perfect. And if the radius is infinity, then the second derivative is zero. Because the second derivative is related, it's a constant factor times the inverse of the radius of the curvature. But now if this radius is quite small, like that, then of course the error is much larger. That's the point. Okay, so now intuitively it's obvious that this makes sense. Okay, uh, but now the next step is to formally prove this. And um, I mean it's not because I want to torture you. Um, it is because this is another nice, very nice example of how we quite easily apply the Taylor formula. Look, this is about the second derivative of our function. Huh? And you know that a Taylor series is a series involving in every term in the nth, in the nth order term we have the nth derivative. And now look also here, we have the second derivative coupled with uh, the second power of h. So, and this is, I mean, whenever you see something like that, uh, the second derivative with the second power, 
then this should immediately remind you of the Taylor series. So maybe this is the second order term in the Taylor series or the error term of, the, of a first order Taylor series, series. And that's what we are going to do. Huh? Actually, look, what the trapezoidal rule does is it fits a straight line between two points. And fitting a straight line is expanding the Taylor series up to the first order term. But when we have a Taylor series of first order, then the error term is of what order? Of second order. And that's what we got here. Okay, yeah, now we already know this formula from theorem, yeah, there are two question marks because this theorem was in the in last semester, it was in the different script and so this reference doesn't work anymore. But you can look it up in the script and it was in the chapter where we introduced polynomial interpolation. This was one of the theorems about polynomial interpolation. And now look, what are we doing here? We do polynomial interpolation between two points. Given this point and that point, we just fit a straight line between these two points. And now we take this formula we already know for the case of fitting a polynomial of degree 1 to <coughs> two points, which is a very easy case. And we could actually explicitly uh, derive this formula, but because we already had this theorem, we just take it. And this theorem tells us something about the approximation error between our original function and the interpolation polynomial. So the difference, f of x minus p of x. p of x is our interpolation polynomial. And we have seen this is the formula for the interpolation error. It's the, so if I take n data points, that's important. We take n data points and that implies that we fit a polynomial of degree n minus 1. Yeah? And then the error term, oh no, sorry, excuse me, we do have n plus 1 data points, because here we start with x0. Huh? We do have n plus 1 data points, which means we fit a polynomial of degree n. Huh? And therefore the uh, error term is of order n plus 1. Huh? So we get the n plus first derivative of x at some intermediate point c. And this point C is somewhere in the whole interpolation interval. It's somewhere in the interval AB. Okay, and now we take the special case for linear interpolation of F with two points. So now we have two points, Xi minus 1 and Xi. These are exactly the two points, these two points. We take these two, these two points and put a straight line in between. And now this formula gives us the approximation error. And the approximation error, we just take this, we put the p of x to the right, that's what we have here. And now we have two points, so we get the second derivative of f divided by um, the uh, 2 factorial, which is 2 times x minus xi minus 1 times x minus xi. You see we have x minus the data points. For every data point we get such a linear factor. Okay, so that's the, that's the error we have. And that's the exact error. That's the exact amount of the error. But I hope you remember there was this little problem with this formula and this is very similar to what we had in the Taylor expansion. Yeah? Because this says for some, for some point ci in the interval. Yeah? Now let's, let's look at this picture or at such a picture again. 
So we do have these two points. This is our straight line approximation. And now the question is, the error depends on the second derivative at some point in the interval. Why some point in the interval? Suppose we, our function looks like that. It's a straight line here, but now here we have a curve and a straight line again. And now we get a large error. And the error depends on the second derivative at some point in the interval. And you, of course, you see where this point is. This point is located around here. And it depends on the function. The function might look like that. And would have a quite a high second derivative here. So it really depends on the function. And that's why here, without looking at the function, we don't know where this point is. That's why it only says for some ci in the interval. Okay, I mean this is kind of a little problem. Yeah? But let's just uh, keep it at this point and we will see how it all uh, will solve. Okay, and now we use this in order to estimate the error of the trapezoidal rule on one sub-interval sub only, on one such sub-interval. We call it epsilon i, which is delta, oh, let me see. We shouldn't call this delta t of h. Yes, sorry. This, of course, is not delta t of h. Yeah, sorry. Um, so please, in the script, just delete this. And everything else is hopefully correct. So this epsilon i, which is the error on one sub-interval, is, oh no, let me see, t of, yes, that's, that's okay. It's t of h, so it's the trapezoidal rule applied to this one sub-interval. Okay, I mean we could also, we could actually even say this is correct if we restrict ourselves only to one sub-interval. But be careful because on the next slide we have delta t of h for the whole interval, sorry. So if we would call this delta t of h, then we should call it Delta, yeah, let's, let's correct it. Uh, we could call it delta ti of h and then this ti of h. That would be nice, yes. Okay, so the error is our trapezoidal formula applied to this one interval minus the integral. Um, is this correct? Let me look. Yes. If we solve this formula for delta t of h, then we put this on the left hand side and the integral on the right hand side, and then we get t of h minus the integral. So the error is t of h minus the integral. That's what we have here. ti of h, oh, and then the i of course here too. Yeah. Okay, so we have the trapezoidal formula minus the correct integral. Okay, and now here we replace this f of x by what we have up here. We replace f of x by this. So then we get minus the integral over p of x minus the integral over this term. That's exactly what we have here. Okay, and now you give me the answer for, for the step from here to here.
What can you see? I mean, mathematics is much about pattern recognition. What do you recognize if you compare these two terms? The P of X and function are equal. They are equal. I mean, what you recognize first is they have to be equal, yeah? because we delete them. Yeah? They have to be equal. Okay. And now the question is why are they equal? Because it is a degree one P of X. Because it's a degree one P of X. It's a linear function. Yes. That's correct. Because what we did up here is we approximated F by a linear function. And of course we know that if we have a linear function, then the trapezoidal rule is exact. Huh? So the trapezoidal rule does nothing but linear, linear interpolation. So the trapezoidal rule does exactly this. Huh? So this is equal to that. So what remains is the error term for linear interpolation, which is not surprising at all. So this is what remains. This is our error epsilon i. The error we have on one subintoil. So now what remains to do is to sum all these errors up. Huh? So now we take the sum over i equal 1 to n. Oops. Oh, excuse me. Did we miss something? Oh no, yes. Um, so, sorry, before we sum up, we first calculate this integral. Yeah? I mean, this integral is something we want to know. It's an integral on this interval, xi minus 1 to xi over these two linear factors uh, dx, over, over the variable x. Okay, that's what we, yeah, we want to solve this integral. We look at this integral and now, I mean, with this substitution, x equal xi minus 1 plus h times t with the new variable t. If we, do, we apply this substitution to this integral, we get this new integral which is of course much nicer. Huh? It's much nicer because it's from 0 to 1 over this simple term dt and the result is minus, minus h power 3 over 6. And this is your first exercise to, to solve this integral. Okay, so for this integral we get this term. Huh? And now let's go to the previous slide. We know that this integral is h power 3 over 6. If we multiply it with this, we get minus second derivative of x times h power 3 over 6 times 2 which is 12. And that's what we have here. So now we, uh, we know that our error is this. On one sub interval. We still don't know this point ci, which is some point in this interval. And what's not really nice is that for each subinterval we need to know such a point ci. But we will now quite elegantly solve this problem. Um, yeah, now we calculate the, the whole trapezoidal error. Yeah? We take the absolute value of the error of the trapezoidal rule on the whole interval, which is the absolute value of the sum over all of these epsilon i. Yeah? And now we have the absolute value of a sum. 
And, and here we apply the triangular in inequality which gives us the absolute value of the sum is less than or equal to the sum of the absolute values. So now we have the sum of the absolute values of the epsilon i and now we can replace this epsilon i by this. And that's what we get here. And we can actually draw the absolute value into the second derivative because 12 is positive and h power 3 is also positive. Okay, yeah. So now we have, uh, I mean we can we can draw this h power 3 over 12 before in front of the sum. Huh? And what remains is this second derivative of f at these points ci. Huh? And now what we do is we, we solve this problem with these many ci we don't know. What we now say is that the second derivative at all these points in our integration into a look. We do have these many subintervals. And there is this, this point maybe C1. And then there is C2. And here is C3 and so on. And what we do is we replace all these second derivatives by the maximum of all of them. I mean we may have uh, 100 different uh, such uh, second derivatives and then of course we can say they are all less than or equal to the maximum of all of them. And actually we make it even easier. We take the maximum of, our f of the second derivative of our function on the whole interval. And this of course is an upper bound for the second derivatives at the individual point ci. So we can easily say that this sum is less than or equal to the sum where we replace these guys by the maximum of the second derivative of f. And now we have solved two problems at, at one time. The second problem is that this sum eliminates itself. Why? Because now look at the argument of this sum. The argument of this sum has no more index i. There is no more index. So all terms in the sum are constant. They do not depend on i. So we can delete the summation symbol and replace it by a factor of n. So we get n times the rest here. That's what we have here. Okay, and now we do have n times h power 3. And now let's go back to this slide. Um, or to this. Yeah. And let's remember this formula. h is b minus a over n. That's what we need now. Yeah. We take, I mean, here we have h times h squared. And now we take this one h and replace it by b minus a over n. Yeah? Or let's, uh, it's even easier to look at n times h is equal to b minus a. Yeah? So we, we take this n and one of the h's and replace it by b minus a. And so we get b minus a times h squared over 12 times the maximum of the absolute second derivative. And we are finished. Now this is our error estimate. The absolute value of our trapezoidal rule error 
is bounded by this value. And it's a bound because here we have the less than or equal. And also here. Okay, yeah. Maybe we go back to the theorem because here we see it in a compact form. We have now proven this. I mean, are there still any questions about this proof? It's not really difficult, but it, it shows you how, again, to use... I mean, it was not exactly the Taylor formula, but it's quite similar. It's the approximation error for uh, interpolation. Any questions about the proof? Okay. Now what we see here is there are two relevant uh, things in this, in this uh, error estimation. The one is the second derivative and it's the maximum of the second derivative. And now you see what happens. Let's look at our function. Yeah, the function may be quite harmless but it may have some ugly parts. And here we may have no error but we have a large error in these areas. Huh? So the maximum of the second derivative, which would actually be here, gives us an upper bound for the error. And it's intuitive why this is an upper bound. Because maybe only in such a small area we have a large second derivative. So the estimate for the error is too high. Huh? And that's why it's only an upper bound. So this is the first thing and the second is, and this is quite nice, that our estimation error um, goes quadratically with, with h. And this is actually much better than having a linear error. Why? Maybe it's not really intuitive to you because uh, h squared grows much faster than a linear h. But that's not what we are about. What is h? What is the, the meaning of h? What is h? The step size. And what would you, what step size would you take? Would you take a large step size, a small step size? Small. 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 Okay. So we shouldn't talk about large h. We should talk about what happens if h goes to zero. And now compare h and h squared for h to zero. For h towards zero, then of course h squared goes much faster to zero than h. Here we have one and here we have one. This would be h. And h squared looks like that, which goes much faster to zero than h. So this is really good news. Good news. Huh? That's very nice we know that the error goes quadratically to zero. For example, if we replace h by, uh, by half of it, by h over 2, what does this tell us immediately about the error? How much would the error re uh, uh, reduce when we uh, replace h by h over 2? Four times. Four times, yes. It's the square of, of one half. So that's really good news. Or if we replace h by h over 10, then the error reduces by a factor of 100. Okay, now let's continue with this good news in mind. Yeah. This is now the picture about reducing 
the step size by a factor of two. Look, here we have the picture with two h, uh, with a uh, step size of two h. Then the trapezoidal rule would put this straight line and this straight line. And the error would be, the error we make in calculating the integral is this area. That's the area of this red region, that's the error we make. Huh? And now if we uh, take a step size of only h, then um, we get these uh, straight lines and now uh, the error is much smaller. It's something like that. It's much smaller and it's actually approximately one-fourth of the area of the red region. But the computation then increase, right? When it decreases step size, is it possible? Yes, the computation time increases and that's a good question. Uh, now if we if we decrease age by a factor of two how much does the computation time increase? Two times. Two times. Why? Yeah, because the number of data points is twice as much. And it comes from this easy formula. Look, H and N are inverse. Yeah? So if I multiply H by a factor of one half, then N is twice as much. Huh? Of course, we have, we double the computation time, but I mean, that's a good deal. So the cost is twice as much, but what we get is four times as much. I mean, that would be a good deal. I mean, if you go to, uh, to some uh, dealer and you say, okay, uh, let me pay, twi pay twice as much and I would now get, instead of one jeans, I would get four. Uh, that would be a good deal. I mean, you would, you would actually spend ten times as much and you would get 100 jeans. Huh? Uh, that's a good deal. So, uh, we are really lucky here. Okay, yeah. But, so, what we see is that delta T of 2H is about four times delta t of h. Or let, let, let's read it from, the, from this side. Delta t of h is delta t of 2h divided by four. That's what we have seen. But of course we can solve it you know, this way too. Yeah? So if we double our uh, step size, then the error will be four times as much. Okay, yeah, and what now follows is a really cool trick. Uh, it's a really cool trick, um, the so-called Richardson extrapolation. Because this trick now, yes, let's look at this picture again. Um, Look, this is our error delta t of h, the red region. And the blue region is, uh, no, it's delta t of 2h, the red region. Uh, and the blue region is delta t of h. And we know that this is a factor of 4 smaller than this. So now, um, Yeah. So the difference between these two areas, let's put it in green. The difference is this shaded area here. This difference here is three quarters 
of um, of the error of the red region because the blue thing is one quarter so the difference is three quarters huh? so what we can do is look what is this difference this difference is the difference between the two errors but at the same time it is also the difference between between the whole integrals. I mean you can of course add the rest down here and then we have T of H which is this, these blue, uh, the sum of these blue trapezoids this is T of H and the sign is T of 2H and the difference between T of 2H and T of H is three quarters of the error that T of H makes. So we have an, a method for estimating three quarters of our error. And that's a good idea because if we know three quarters of our error then we know the error. And knowing the error is really good because now we can subtract this error from our trapezoidal formula and we have the exact integral. Huh? That's the idea. That's the basic idea. I mean it's not exactly true what I said. We don't know the exact error but we get a much better estimate of the error. That's the idea. The idea of this Richardson extrapolation is to get a much better estimate of the error. So combining uh, T of H and T of 2H gives us a much better estimate which is much better than T of H. That's the idea of Richardson extrapolation. And this idea is so important because it can be applied to numerical integration but it also can be applied to any numerical estimate as soon as I do have um, an error estimate uh, which depends on some power of our step size. And this is for many, for many numerical algorithms you do have an error estimate depending on the step size and when you do have this then you can apply Richardson extrapolation. And we will see, we, we can apply it here to numerical integration, we can apply it to numerical differentiation, we will be able to apply it to uh, the solution of differential equations. There are so many applications of this Richardson extrapolation and that's why we spend some time on it. Okay, now let's go into the formal derivation. I mean what we do, what I do here formally is the same thing I explained on the picture. Okay, T of H is the integral plus some error term. Yeah? yeah, actually it would be nicer to first write this because T of H is exactly, it's the integral plus the error. So here we would have the equal. But it's only approximately the integral plus C times H squared. Because this only was an upper bound. We only do have an upper bound with this H squared. Okay, and now let's look at T of 2H. For T of 2H, the error increases by a factor of 4. That's the only difference. So we replace this 1 here by 4. Okay, and now we take the difference. That's what we did on the picture. We take now T of 2H minus T of H. Huh? We just subtract this from this and you see the integral cancels out and we get uh, 3 times delta T of H. Huh? Yeah, if you look at this, 3 times delta T of H approximately. Huh? And now we solve this for delta T of H and we get delta T of H is one-third 
of T of 2H minus T of H. Yeah, and, and let's look back at the picture. It's one third. Why is it one third? Look, we said this is three quarters and this error is one quarter. And the ratio between one quarter over three quarter is one third. That's why we get one third here. Okay. Yeah. And look, I mean, it's, it's really easy. Now we have an, an estimate of delta T of H coming from and that's the cool thing. We don't need, any, need to know anything about delta T of 2H. What we do is we apply the trapezoidal rule with the step size 2H and we apply it with step size H. So we have to do the whole computation twice. Yeah? We, do, uh, we apply it with 2H and we apply it with H. Yeah? But, I mean, don't worry about the computational effort. Because the computational effort is not much more than uh, T of H. Why? Oh, that's quite easy. I mean, the, the, the biggest effort in the computation is calculating F of X, Xi, huh? the function values. And let's look at this picture. When we calculate the f of xi for h for the smaller step size, we calculate one, two, three, four, five function values. But what about f of 2h? We don't have to do it again, we have it already. Uh, I mean, of course, it's a good idea to store these function values and then to reuse them. Uh, so the computational effort, uh, you can actually neglect it. Uh, the effort for, for calculating T of 2H2. Huh? But this idea gives us a much better uh, approximation. Okay, and now we can continue and estimating our integral. The integral is T of H minus delta T of H. Huh? Look, if we take, solve this for the integral, then we take this delta t of h with a minus here, and that's what we have. Huh? So the integral is t of h minus the error. Huh? And now we have t of h minus one third of this, minus this. And uh, you see that we have t of h twice. We have it here and here. So this is t of h minus minus plus plus one-third T of H, so this gives four-third T of H, and that's what we have here. So the integral is approximately four-third T of H minus one-third T of 2H. And again, this gives us a much better estimate. Um, what I didn't tell you here is how good this estimate now is. We don't know it yet, but I tell you it's much better. This is a really easy and nice and visual derivation of this Richardson extrapolation formula. Is this clear? Intuitively? Yeah? Yeah. Yes. It, it's, it still works. Yeah. It always works. And in, up to here, we don't know about the, the error for, for this new formula. Huh? It might be the case that it's even higher. Huh? But we will now get 
a new estimate. Yeah? We will now get a t we will see a theorem that tells us how small this error now is. Yeah? And yeah, about your question. It maybe there are cases where this does not reduce the error. Yeah? Um, and these are cases where the error with 2H or with H is already very small. Look at such an example. Let's take these three points and this is the trapezoidal formula and now if we have a function which looks like that where these two arrows cancel out then the error is zero with h, so it can't be smaller with, with this uh, Richard's next operation. But if it's already zero, we don't have to reduce anything. Okay, now let's look at the, the general derivation. Yeah. Now this is really, this is now the general formula for Richard's next operation which can be applied to any numerical algorithm uh, if some assumptions hold. First it has to be an algorithm where you have some step size h which you can vary. Uh. Um, and this algorithm estimates some function f. So we are talking about the asymptotic behavior of some function f for h towards zero. In our example, f was the trapezoidal rule. Yeah? Um, um, let me see. Yes, yes. So this f is the trapezoidal formula. And what we want to estimate is the integral. Yeah? So the trapezoidal formula is an estimate for the integral. And now suppose we do have such a Taylor expansion. Huh? So uh, our f of h is a0, so a constant term, plus a1 times h power p in the trapezoidal rule this p was 2. Huh? So we, the, the first the, the highest order or the leading term in the error expansion was uh, of power 2. And then there come some remaining terms. So plus big O of H power R. Big O means that this H power R is the leading term. There may be other terms but with higher powers than R. That's the semantics of this big O. Huh? Okay, and here you see where A0, which is equal to F of 0. Look, if you take H equals 0, then this vanishes and this vanishes, and what remains is A0. Huh? So for H equals 0, you get this A0. And so now you see. In the, in the case of our trapezoidal rule, um, so this f was t of h is equal to the integral between a and b f of x dx plus some constant times h squared plus Let's write it O of H power R with R greater than 2. That's what we have from the trapezoidal rule. Huh? And now we do it in a more general way. So this capital F is an, the approximation for this value A0. And you see, A0 does not depend on H. And this is intuitive because our integral does not depend on H because it's the exact value. <coughs> okay. So now we start with this 
in mind. Um, oh yes, and this is an error here. Because this must of course be smaller, so it must be P less than R. Sorry, is this in the script too? I'm not sure because I thought I corrected it yesterday. Huh? It's a greater. Okay, so it's the same error in the script. Please correct it. Yeah, of course this has to be a higher power than this. Okay, and now we do a similar derivation we just did for the trapezoidal rule. Suppose we know our estimation f for some step size h and for some multiple of h. So in, our, in the case of the trapezoidal rule we had q equal 2. So we knew the, the, the formula for h and for 2h. But it can be done even more general. You can use 3h and it still works. Or 4 or 5, whatever. So for f of h we get this formula, which is exactly this. And now we replace h by q times h. So we get a 0 plus a 1 times q times h to the power p plus big O of h power r. Um, yeah. And now what we do next is, look, what do, we, what do we want to know? We want to know our exact result. Let's go back to this slide. We took t of h and t of 2h and finally we took these two equations and we solved these two equations for the exact value for the integral. Okay? So, and what we now do is the same thing. Um, we now solve these two equations for a0, which is the exact value. That's what we want to know. So now we solve these two equations for a0. How can we solve these two? I mean, it's not a good idea to just subtract them, because then we lose a0. Huh? Maybe we should do this uh, on the blackboard. So now is so we want to eliminate this term. Huh? We want to eliminate the a1 term in order to get the a0. Huh? So then we can multiply this first equation by q to the power p. So then we get q power p times f of h is equal to q power p uh, a0 plus okay and here we have f of q times h is equal to a0 plus and now here we have the same term, q power p a1 h power p plus big O of h power r. And now we subtract the second from the first equation. So we take the first equation minus the second. 
And then we get uh, Q power P F of H minus F of Q times H is equal to Q power P minus 1 times A0 plus big O of H power R. These two guys, they cancel out. And here we have this minus this, which, which is Q power P minus 1 times A0 plus, and here we have two terms depending on H power R. Yeah? We don't care about some constant factors here. What's important is that this goes to 0 with H power R. So we don't care about the details. We only care about uh, the power of H here, which is the same. Okay, and now we solve this whole thing for a zero. And now let me see, um, yes. Yeah. Before we do this, we split this term up into um, yeah, we split up this term into f of h times q power p minus 1 plus um, plus f of h. Okay? So this is q power p times f of h minus f of h plus f of h. So this is exactly this. Okay? Minus f times q of h is equal to q power p minus 1 times a0 plus big O of h power r. Why did we make this trick? Yeah, because I know that this is the goal I want to derive. Huh? So now we bring this to the left hand side. And then we divide the whole equation by this. And now we get a zero is equal to, look, when we divide the whole equation by this term, then this cancels out here. So we get f of h minus, um, no, plus, plus f of h. So we take these two together. They both will be divided by this, plus f of h minus f of q times h divided by q power p minus 1 plus big O of h power r. And that's it. Okay, I mean this was really a, a kind of an easy derivation, easy solution. Two equations with two unknowns, a0 and a1, and we solve it for a0. And that's what we get. And so now we have a formula, a new formula, for estimating our desired value, which in case of the trapezoidal rule would be the integral. So here this would be the integral is equal to the trapezoidal formula applied with step size h. Here again, 
And now the trapezoidal formula applied with 2H or with 5H, whatever. You can select this Q as you like. Divide it by Q power P minus 1. Plus some error term which now is of higher order. And the good thing is we even know the order of our error term. So now we can get a new estimate of the error. But because R is bigger than P, this is a much better formula. So we reduce the error from the order P to the order R by applying this Richardson extrapolation. And that's, I mean this formula, if you take this formula and apply it to uh, Q equal 2 um, and what is P? And P equal 2 because for the numerical integration we had an estimate with P equal 2 and R would actually be equal 4 if you replace these Q equal to P equal to and R equal 4 then you would actually get this formula for the numerical integration plus some error term. So this is a special case of what we have here. Yeah. Okay, and now let's look at this theorem. This theorem includes what we just derived, but it goes even one little step further. Because if we now know the, the, the full Taylor expansion of our estimation F, which is like A0 plus A1 times H to some power P1 uh, plus A2 times H power P2 and so on. You see here in this formula we can have arbitrary exponents and for example for the numerical integration uh, it starts with H power 2 and we will see how it continues. It depends on the formula you use. If we use the trapezoidal rule uh, you will see. Yeah? Okay, if we have such a Taylor expansion of our approximation formula, then we recursively can compute F1 of H, which is, which is a, a F of H. This is nothing new. Uh, and this formula, that's what we have seen on the slide before. It's exactly this formula. So uh, our estimate is f of h plus f of h minus f of q times h divided by q power p minus 1. And that's what we have here. fk plus 1 of h is fk of h plus this uh, ratio here. Yeah. And you see it's q to the power, not to the power p, but to the power pk, p1, p2, p3 and so on. So when you have such a long Taylor expansion you can repeatedly apply the Richardson extrapolation. So you apply it once for, for getting f, so first you get f1 which is the original estimate. Then you calculate f2 by applying this once and when you have f2 then you apply it again to get F3 and you will successively use the exponents in the Taylor expansion. And you will get an even better and better and better estimate for um, the quantity you want to know. Okay, and here comes really the contents of this theorem. This theorem now tells you that Fn of H, so if you apply this Richardson extrapolation n minus 1 times, then you get Fn of H. 
And now the error is A0 plus AN to the power n times h power pn h power pn so if you get f3 for example then the leading term in the error is this so you would you would actually delete all these error terms yeah And proving this is not much harder than this. I mean, we did it, this was actually the, for, the, for an inductive proof, this was the base, the first step. And now we have to apply the induction principle in order to derive that this works if you continue it. It's really just this little induction argument and then you can write down this inductive formula. Okay, yeah, and on Wednesday we will now finally apply what we learned today to examples. Yeah, let's look. Look, we will, we will look at such a triangulation scheme starting with some estimations for different values of h and then finally we will, good, we will get extremely good approximations. Huh? Okay, thank you.